Okay, um, first of all, again, I would like to say good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our seventh Blue Health Virtual Seminar. Uh, Blue Health Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows health professionals to discuss current management updates uh, of different health-related topics for, be for better patient care. And uh, this pro the program is brought to you by, as always, Blue Health Ethiopia. Uh, it's a medical consultancy company founded by uh, medical doctors and a computer engineer, and we aim to, <clears throat> to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge in preventive medicine. Uh, I'm going to be your host, Adam Gitacho. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CTO uh, of Plural Zetopia, and we are honored to have uh, Dr. Malako Gitacho here with us. And he is going to uh, update us, or uh, he's, giving, he's going to give us a presentation on the approach to, uh, to ECG. Uh, and uh, this session uh, is going to last for about uh, 60 minutes, which is one hour. And uh, we'll begin with the uh, presentation of Dr. Malaku. Uh, he's going to give us a, the presentation. After that, there will be a short Q&A session. So participants can ask their questions about the subject uh, in the Q&A section of the, <clears throat> the Zoom. So participants, please use the only the Q&A section to ask questions about the subject. Uh, and uh, any other questions you have, you can contact me directly through the chat. And uh, this uh, seminar is going to have uh, a one CEU, CPD certificate. Uh, I think I've introduced enough. Dr. Malaku, uh, the, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. So I think my voice, can you hear me? Like for all of yes. us. Yes, okay. we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. So I'm also happy like to involve in, in this uh, important topics. So having ECG interpretation, one of uh, a core competency area uh, for any emergency care, uh, service where emergency care is given. So I would like to thank you the Blue Hill for inviting me to give this important lecture. So I think I can proceed now. So, So here is my outline. So we'll discuss on the, like the cardiac conduction system. So how the conduction system, the heart is going. And the others will see like a highlight on the ECG lead placement is where, where do we put for special for monitors and for 12 bit ECGs and so on. So the others will see on the most important thing we'll see on the approach to ECG reading. We'll see on the waves, intervals and segment and so on. So coming to the, so the cardiac conduction system, so cardi cardiac conduction system is designed for electrical impulse creation and propagations. So it allows for the initiation of impulse in the atriums and so subsequently to reach to the AV nodes and to the uh, bundle of ease and the Purkinje and later on result on depolarization of the ventricle. So knowing this is the most important. So as we know, like SCNOD is our a pacemaker. So so the depolarization is to start from the ACA nodes. So when you see the ACA nodes, so it will depolarize to uh, the atriums. So that, that so the first uh, deep, uh, the first deflection or the first depolarization we'll see on the atrium. So it should be represented by the P waves. So the P wave will show us whether it's sinus or not, or is it uh, it's is it from a CA node or not? The other thing is that how is the atrium tissue like? We see the shape of the P wave. So the shape of periods show us so whether the atrial tissue is intact or not. So the second, so the second one is there is a segment from P wave to to the prior to the start of the QRS, so which called us the PR segment. So the PR segment is the area where there is no depolarizations. So which means so the impulse reach to the AV nodes. So there is no depolarization. So this is the most important area where uh, so AV nodes abnormalities here. So like when you say like first degree AV block, second degree AV block and so on. So the PR segment is the most important area. 
So the other, the next, the next deflection in general is the QRX complex. So the QRX complex in general tell us like the, so once it's fast, the, the impulse from bundle of ease, so it reached to the parking J. So the parking J, so it's the once impulse, uh, the parking J fibers, so it's reached to the intervent septum. So it will depolarize subsequently to the ventricle. So it will show us the QR is show us the ventricle depolarization. So the next is the STT segment. So this segment is the area where between the, where there is no electrical activity there, there is no depolarization or repolarization. So between the ventricular depolarization to the ventricular repolarization. So this is also the most important where the Parkinger fibers, like the impulse is generating well or not, like especially if patient is necrosis, Patients with MI and so on, it will tell us like whether it's segment elevation or depression. This is also one of the concern, and especially in the emergency area. So the next wave is the uh, T waves. So the T wave is so initially, as we say, it, like the we'll see on the arterial depolarizations. We couldn't see the arterial depolarization on the ECG because the arterial depolarization will be high on the ventricular depolarization, which means so the repolarization will be high by the QRS. So here on the ventricular repolarization, so you can easily see the uh, T waves. So the T waves will, will tell us the ventricular repolarizations. So in general, so when you see the ECG paper, so prior to interpreting any ECG, you have to look at the speed of the paper. So the speed of paper as a standard should be with 25 millimeter per second. So the 25 millimeter per second is a standard for interpretation. So we'll look at it later on, so how to calculate the rates and so So if it's 50 millimeters per second and so on, either we have to double it or we have to adjust the, our ECG motions to 25 millimeters per second. So once if this once we are sure that's 25 millimeters per second, so subsequently we need to uh, interpret. So, so this is, as you can see here, so this is a P wave. So, so this is a P wave arterial depolarizations. So, so when you say intervals, so it st st starts from the arterial depolarization in, in its, and it in this with at the end of atrial depolarization. So we couldn't see the atrial depolarization. So we can uh, confirm with prior to the initiation of ventricular depolarization. So this is the intervals. So that is, this one is a segment, as I have mentioned earlier, this is the most important area where, so we can describe the AV nodes and so on, any AV node abnormalities, any block or not. So this is also one of the important area. So subsequently, so as, so we have to interpret, so the number of small box. So once if it's 25 millimeter per second, so one small box is considered as 40 milliseconds or 0 0.04 second. So, so each larger box has five small box. So which means five times 40 milliseconds. So one large box, so one large box will have 200 milliseconds or like 0 0.2 seconds. So coming to the precordial leads, so on precordial lead, so this is also the most important, uh, knowing the lead placement is the most important. So we can start from the V1. So V1 is already we have to place on the fourth intercostal space, fourth intercostal space, just lateral to the sternum. So V2 will put on, on the same intercostal space, on the fourth intercostal space, but to left side of the sternum. So this is a V1, then V2. So the next we'll put on a V4. So before we put one interspace below the V2, which is around fifth intercostal space. So at the mid clavicular lines. So we'll put on the V5, V6 on the same inter intercostal space on the fifth intercostal space. So V5 will put on anterior axillary line, V6 will be on the mid axillary line. So if you misplace this ECG, let's say like, let's put, if you put like V1 and V2, like IRA, let's say it's on second intercostal or third intercostal space. So it will cause, so misinterpretation. So it will cause like always, so V1, S is, the S wave is predominant. So the V1, R wave is not predominant. R2 ratio is usually less than one. So if you put V2 higher up, so we'll put on R star pattern. So we'll interpret as, right bundle branch block, but so that is, that's not the right, that's not the right uh, interpretation because that was the misplacement of the ECG. So knowing the exact ECG placement is the most important. 
So subsequently, it's not only this one. So if you suspect a patient was right ventricular infraction or a patient who have any MI on inferior lips, always when you suspect either posterior MI or uh, right ventricular infraction. So on that, so we need to reverse the ECG. So we have two techniques. So the first one, so you reverse the whole. So initially you start from the fourth intercostal space from the left side, the right side of the sternum. Now we'll put on, so we'll start from like the fourth intercostal space from left side of the sternum. So it's on V2 on the same on the right side. And that's just the mirror image of the initial. So this is one, one of the ECG placement or not. The other option, so you'll put the initial, so it just will take the B4. So B4 was on the fifth intercostal space at the midclavicular line, but we'll shift, we'll take only the B4, reverse it. When you say R, so the reverse it B4, so we'll put on fifth intercostal space at the midclavicular mid -clavicular line on the right side. So this is, so you can, you can use either of it. So I think the right one is the uh, easiest way. So we'll put initially, the, as a normal lead placement. Subsequently, if a patient has inferior lead, so inferior well in mind, if you have a suspicion of like right ventricular infraction, so you have to took so the V4 and you have to put on the fourth intercostal speed on the right, right midclavicular line. So if there is a segment elevation on the reverse V4, so we'll consider that patient has right ventricular infractions. So the, others, the other lead placement is on the for a monitor, so usually you can put either five leads, sometimes you might use the four leads. So on five leads, so usually there is also a color for white, like black, red, or green, or the purple one. So some, so the color usually is common for all, if not, so we can the labeling. So on the labeling, there is RA, LA, LL, and RA. So when you say RA, that's right after. So now, when you say right upper, so you have to put starting from a second intercostal space from the mid clavicular, so to the level of a deltoid area. It's not, will not start from like for intercostal space, it's like that of the for a 12 BD. So the others, so you lift the left arm, so LA, so one, and the others, right lower, which is right costal margin, LL is for left costal margin. So this, this, this one is for the monitors. So you can remember like uh, smoke, ABBA, fire, and so on. So the most important, if, if you can't remember, just use the acronyms like RA, LA, R means right. So R, A is up, the upper one. So right after, left after, right lower, and left lower. So as I tried to mention initially, so ECG interpretation is one of the competency area. So on my graduation time, we we're having a survey for the graduating medical students from uh, two Ethiopian medical schools from two referral hospitals. So we'll try to look at the competency area. So unfortunately, so for they are having, like for, we try to for basic ECG reading, like rates, axis, and so on. So we, have, we also assess for the arrest rhythms, which means like for cancerous electrical activity, uh, for BFI, VTAC, and assistor. So only one third of the participants, which are around like 32.75% was correctly interpreted the arrest rhythms. So the most, so the most neglected or the most misinterpreted was a cancerous electrical activity. So only like less than one percent of the participants was picking the parcellus electrical activity. So this survey shows us the competency levels on ACG interpretation was low. So we need to focus on the ACG interpretation. So taking this blue hills, Ethiopia, having like to increase this uh, ECG reading is one of uh, appreciate uh, that one of the appreciative things because we need to once if we fail to interpret, we can't intervene for the patient. So ECG for the emergency, one of uh, a competency area. So we need to scale it up our competency levels. So coming to the approach to ECG, we have like eight steps of meters. So always we need to start from the rhythms. So when you say rhythms, is it sinus or not? Is it regular, irregular, and so on? Once you uh, determine the rhythms, so you continue the rate. So you have to calculate the rate. 
So subsequently, you will see the waves for each waves, like P waves, Q waves, wave, T waves. So subsequently, you will see for the intervals from PR intervals, and like the QT interval, and so on. So the others, finally, you have to check for any ectopic beat or not. So this will be the easiest way to remember for approach to it. So rhythm rate check, wave, then to the segments. So always, we, we, don't, we don't have to focus for the abnormality. Always you have to start from the normal reading. So from the, the normal step by steps. Always, if you see just a segment elevation V3 before, so you don't have to be distracted on that. So always you have to start with a stepwise approach. So coming to the measuring of the rhythms, we have different meters, but the easiest one is paper and pencil meters. So you have to make, uh, so, Always, you have to take the rhythm strips. Usually, lead to the rhythm strip for our ECG. So we have to take the lead to. So we have to check for R to R interval. So at least you have to mark three or four R to R intervals. So you check. So by shifting for each R to R intervals waves, so you have to check for the regularity. So if that, if they are not fitting on that, so that's irregular. So you have to say that there is irregularity or patient has decided. So when you say in general, rhythms, so we have to ask R to R interval. So that's the most usually commonly practiced. As well, you have to check P to P interval as well. So let's say a patient has a R to R interval for patient has sub-degree AV blocks. So the R to R, when you say sub-degree AV blocks, so they have a complete dissociation, the atrium and the ventricular depolarization. So when you check the R to R interval, R to R interval might be regular. So we need to check as well for the P waves. Is it a P wave? P2P waves regular or not, and the others for even rate calculation. So for atria fretta, for examples, so usually the block is two to one, three to one, and so on. So when you calculate the rate, usually our calculation for four ventriculars, but we can calculate as well for the uh, atrial rate as well. So the others, so is the ventricular rhythm regular or not? So once check that one, you have to calculate the rate, how many beats per minute. So as well for the, uh, the atria, I have to calculate that one. Always we need to check for a P waves. So is the P wave should, so is every P wave is preceded by Q, if, is every QR is preceded by P waves. So always when you say sinus, P waves should be upright, especially on the lead tools, it should be upright and every QR should be preceded by P wave. We don't have, we don't have to have like any drop beats. So the others, so this is, when you say sinus rhythms, also all about the P waves. So normal, when you say normal P waves, so expect on the lead, special in the rhythm, a strip, which is a lead two. So it should be positive. And on the AVR, we expect is negative. So if it's reversed, you have to check whether our lead placement is correct or not. So sometimes patients, they can have dextrocardia and so on. So always you need to, to check that. So when you say, so that's a sinus, so a regular, so that's the rate. Is it the rate is below 60 or above 100? So if it's above 100, so that's a tachyarrhythmia. So if it's once tachyarrhythmia, subsequently, is it a wide complex, narrow complex? We see that when you say wide complex, always are, it's, it's all about the ventricular polarization, which means the QR is. So the, Q, the QR is widening is important as well. So if it's below 60, so that's a bradyarrhythmia. So sometimes with sinus, regular, so sinus, you might, you might get sinus rhythms, but irregular, the rate might be with the normal range, like from 60 to 100, that's, it might be the sinus arrhythmia as well. So coming to this ECG, when you see this ECG, so, so we, can, we can, is it regular or irregular? So we can see with pencil meters, so we can, so grossly you can see here from there is a QR race, so next QR race, so it's around one, two, three and a half large box. So the next key, the next R wave is larger, it's more prolonged. So we can count it one, two, three, four, five. So it's regular. So we can check here from here to here. So here to here, this is more prolonged. Now this is more prolonged. It seems similar with the previous one. So and so, so this is now. So this is irregular. So the next one is so is every QR race is preceded by P wave. Now let's check this one. So this is lead to our rhythm strip. So there is P wave, QR race, P wave, QR race, P wave, QR race. So you can see here, every QR race is by preceded by P wave. So, this, 
So this is sinus. So P wave is upright. Sinus irregular. So the rates might be normal. So this is a sinus arterial. So this is a sinus arterial. So the next one is, so we'll check the rhythm, whether regular or regular. So the next one will calculate the rate. So on the rate, the most important things, rate can be calculated by the ECG. So that the ECG might misinterpret, especially if you get like tall T waves. So we might consider it as the QR rate. So you might uh, you might force interpret like the rate might be considered on the monitor. You see 300, 400, 350, and so on. But on the reality, so it might be half, like 150. But it might count. Well, if you picked T wave, you, the monitor might consider it as a QR rate. So it might be misinterpreted by a monitor. So we need to check by our, by ourselves. So when you say the rate, so always we have to check the speed of the paper. So always you have, it should be 25 millimeters per second. So 40 milliseconds for one small box, 0 0.2 second for like five larger box, five times four, four. That means like five times 40. So the ways to calculate rates, there are three main methods for calculating of ECG rates. So there is no specific methods and the preference varies between pinchart to pinchart. There is no specific like which one is based, it's not that much, but usually the, as a clinician uh, preference. So the first one is uh, large square meters. So when you, see, when you say large square meters, so so you'll count five small box as one large box. So always, if the large, we are counting large box, so you'll divide 300 large square, uh, square is equal to one, min, one minute at the paper speed of 25 millimeter per second. So which means, so when you say six, like when you say 25 millimeter per second, so if you are taking for one minute, so we need to multiply by 60, by 60, and we have to divide to five. So larger box, 300 over larger box will get the rate. So we can, if you, let's say this one. So on the first one, so from R to R interval, see, there is one large box, which means 300 over one. So this one is 300 feet per, per minute. So the next one, so you can see here two larger box from R to R. So here one large box, second larger. So 300 over two is around 150 bits per minute. So you can count the last one. So last one you can see here. So from R to R, so there is five larger box. One, two, three, four, five. So 300 or over five, so it's around 60. So this is almost simple. So we can count from R to R how many larger box is there and we can divide 300 to larger box, you can count. But this might be difficult if you a patient has tachycardia. No, if you have like tachycardia and the larger square meter, it might not be preferred. So we usually use the small square meters. So when you see small square meters, so we'll count small square meters, 1,500, over the number of small box. So let's say this one, the first one is, as we see from R to R, so we can count one, two, three, four, five. So which means like 1,500 over five, that's 300. So if you use large box for this, so from this to this one, from R, R to R intervals, one large box, so 300 over one, that's 300, so almost similar. But if it's like, if it is tachycardic, so we might not get uh, exact large box. So the, small, the smaller small box might be easy to count. So the third one is, so R wave meters. So the R wave meters, especially is important if your rhythm is irregular. So let's say patient has atrial fibrillation. So it's difficult to count from R to R interval for the first, the one you count might be tachycardic one, it might be bradycardic one. So it's not similar for all the rhythm state. So for irregularity, the preferred one is R wave meter. So we'll count all the R waves on the rhythm strip. So we we'll multiply by six. So for the 10 seconds. So if you have a six, like if it's a, if six seconds meters, usually you can multiply by 10, but our standard ECG papers is a 10 seconds. So we'll count so the number of R waves. So now this is let's say this is our rhythm strip. So we'll count so the number of R waves. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine times six. So it's around 54. So we count these ones with small box, larger box, and so on. 
So you can see here with the number of small blocks, they counted around 27. So 1,500 over 27. So it's around 56. With larger blocks, also similar. With the R wave meters, almost comparable. So which means usually you can use either of, but if it's irregular, the R wave meter is preferred. Preferred. So we can't use the larger box or the larger or the small square meters. So the others easiest way. So they can use also we can, if you want to memorize like 300, 150, 175, 60, 50, 42. So we can use the number of R to R intervals. How many large boxes do we have? So let's say this one's lead to our written strips. So we can start here. So here. So a larger box. So we will count if you get. The first larger box, you'll say 300. So if you, get, if you get the second larger box, you'll count 150. So let's say this one. I'm not sure whether it's visible or not. So here, so this one, the larger box, we count 300. So if our R wave is here, so we count as 300. So now our R wave is the, the next one. So one, two, 300, 150. So the rates are around 150. So if you don't have this one, so let's say, so this one is, let's ignore this one. So 300, 150, so 300, sorry, 300, 150, 175, so then 60, so it's around 60. So we can count. So if you memorize, you can use like 300, 150, 175, 60, 50, and 40. But this is a gross estimation. So usually you can estimate from 50 to 60, but easily you can memorize just R wave meters, just it can use for regular as well as well as for irregular ones. So just count it, the number of R wave and multiply by six. So the third one is a cardiac axis. So cardiac axis also is important, and usually it represents the sum of depolarization vectors generated by individual cardiac myocytes. So clinically, it's reflected by the ventricular axis. So our normal axis, the QR is, axis is between negative 30 to positive 90. But in pediatrics, usually, so the right chamber is more predominant, especially at time of birth. So usually it's from uh, like plus 30 to the level of 109. So it's a positive. So subsequent is shifted to the left side. So this one is negative 30 to 90 because of the left ventricular predominance. So he, this is our quadrant meters. So you can see here. So Normal axis is start from negative 30, which is the level of AVM, from negative 30 to positive 90. This is our so a normal axis. So from nine, negative 30, which is from AVM to negative 90, we consider as left axis deviations. So that is from positive 90 to the level of 180. So this is the right axis deviation. So that is the extreme axis deviation from negative 90 to 180. So so it's it's difficult to memorize this one, but we'll uh, we'll uh, use the next meters. But the tricky one is usually, so especially if you use the quadrant meters. So especially that usually we usually practice the lead one and the AVF one. So so usually if you use lead one and, the, and AVF, so it's it will consider all from zero to negative nine is considered as left axis deviation. But on the reality, from zero to negative 30 degree, it's a physiologic left axis deviation. It's not the pathologic. So we consider this one is a normal axis deviation. So the pathologic left, left, left axis deviation is considered from negative 30 to negative 90. We'll look at it next on the next slides. So methods of axis interpretation, we have different methods. So you can use the quadrant method, three lead analysis, and the isoelectric lead analysis. So we can read subsequently on the isoelectric lead analysis. So the, the isoelectric lead analysis usually, is, so the exact calculation, so at what degree do we have the cardiac axis? But we usually practice the quadrant meters. So prior to going to the quadrant meters, just for a clarification, when you say positive, so when you say it's positive, so RTS ratio is more than one, which means the R wave is greater than, is uh, greater than the S wave. If it's, if it's that, so we call us a positive. If it is the R wave and the S wave is equal, so we, we call this equiphasic. Equi so this is equal. 
So when you say equifizy, this is also important, especially important for the calculation of the exact axis for the isoelectric lead axis. So the others, when you say negative, so S wave is predominant. So if S wave, S -wave is predominant, it's a negative. And if it's R wave is predominant, we call that is so a positive. So coming to the so the quadrant meters, so so we we'll, we we'll use lead one and AV for cardiac acceleration. So when you say it's lead one is positive, which means R wave is predominant on lead one, and and R wave is also predominant on A wave. That's a normal axis, which means so lead one is here. So we'll shade this one. So when you say lead one is positive, which means this is a lead one. So we'll shade all the lead one here. Positive means towards the lead. So here is positive. It's positive. So lead one is positive. So when you say lead lead F lead A wave is positive, so here is our A wave. So we'll so A wave is positive means towards the A wave. So we'll shade this one as well. So you can see this is our intersection area. So so you remember from the previous one. So the normal axis is from negative 30 up. So that's normal. So all both of them is up. So that's a normal axis division. So next lead one here is the lead one. So lead one is positive meaning so towards each towards the lead one. So this one will be the axis one. So lead A B F is negative, which means so this one the A B F. So negative means away from the A B F. So we can take here so this one, so this one, and we'll take the intersection. So this is our intersection. So so our intersection is from zero to negative 90. So we have to be cautious here because so in general, so we can consider as left axis division, but I, to I told you earlier that from, so a normal one is start from negative 30 here. So start from here, negative 30 to zero. So it's considered as all the left axis division, but from zero to negative 30, so that's a physiology left, left axis division. So if it's above negative 90, the part of it. So if you get left like lead one is up and lead A wave is down, so you're not considered as left axis division. So we have to check for the next method, which means a third lead analysis. So in general, you can memorize like if they are leaving the page, so lead one is up and A wave is down, leaving the page, they are lifting. So this is a left axis one. So a third one, so lead one is negative, which means when you say this is a lead one. Lead one is negative means away from a lead one. So we can shade here. So we can share here, shade, and this one shade. So the next lead ABF is positive, which means so this is ABF, so towards the towards the ABF. So we can take the intersection. So this is the intersection one. So from positive 90 to 108. So this is a right axis division. So in general, so if lead one is down and a waves up, they are towards each other. They are kissing each other. So we consider as the right thing. So if they are kissing each other, so that's right axis division. If they are leaving the page, they are lifting each other. So that's left axis division, but we have to confirm with the, the, with the second meters. So if they are both ups, so that's normal axis division. So the other options, so we might get lead one is negative, which means lead one here, so we'll take so away. So this one is down. So this is away. So the next one, lead A wave. Lead A wave is negative. So which means away from A wave, which is so this is our, our intersection A. So this one is so if they are both negative, that's extreme. So which means both down, down. If they are down, so that's one of the extreme acceleration. So just to come up to see this ECG. So Lead one is up, which is positive, and we check this A wave. Lead one is up, so if it's both positive, so that's normal acceleration. So we, we don't have to consider with other leads. So the second meter, especially if you get, if you get especially on, so lead one is up and A wave is negative on the quadrant meter. If you get left axis division, so we have to confirm with a three lead analysis meters, which means lead one. So lead one, lead two, and the A wave. 
So, so we can see here. So if say, so let's say lead one is negative, which means lead one is here. So we have to, so, so we have to shape on the left side away. So if say lead two is positive, so this one, a lead two is positive. So you have to mark to abyss each other. So if it's up, so to abyss each other, so we'll take the intersection. So on this, so we'll take, we'll take, the intersection of three of them. So if it gets three of the, interse the intersection, we'll consider as the axis. So for this one, so our axis will be from positive 90 to 150. So that's the right axis deviations. So this is also similar. So now we can check with this one. So as you can mention earlier, so lead one is down. So lead one is negative and a wave is up. So they are kissing each other towards each other. So that's the right axis division. No need of uh, taking with a third one. So we can check. So with a lead two, so lead two is up. So we consider as that's the right axis division. So in general, so we can memorize like uh, we similar to that of the quadrant meter, the lead one, lead one in AVF. But after checking AVF and lead two, if they're similar morphology, like lead two is up and AVF is up. So our interpretation will be correct with uh, interpretation of lead one and ABF. But the, if the morphology is different, which means lead two and ABF is different, so, the, so that, that will be the physiology left, left axis division. So it will not be the pathology one. So the other example, so we can see lead one is up and ABF is down. So they are leaving the page, for, which means on the quadrant meters, so that is a left axis deviations. But we'll check now, if you get the left axis deviation, you have to check with a lead two. So whether they have similar morphology or not. So this one is everything. So this is negative, so similar morphology, that's a pathologic left axis deviation. So the other most important knowing the axis deviations to consider our differential diagnosis. So if you have left axis deviation, so we'll consider like left metric hypertrophy, left anterior fascicular block, LBB, inferior lemmy, and so on. Sometimes like always pregnant ascites, uh, patients who have ascites might be shifted to the left, so they might have left axis deviations. So that's a differential for right axis deviations. So it might, it might be like right bend hypertrophy, left posterior fascicular block, right, right bend branch block, lateral OMI, or sometimes patient has for pulmonary or patient has uh, massive P and so on, they can have right axis deviations. So the others, so coming to, so we have finished. So the rhythm rate axis. Now we have to focus on the wave and the intervals. So when you see waves, so P waves, what? So it's all about the depolarization right and left. So usually, so P wave is like less than small, small squares, less than three small squares, and the height will be less than 2.5 uh, small squares. And usually they are upright on the lead one, lead two and A wave and they are inverted on AVR and you might get biphasic in, in B1. So this one, the biphasic one. So the abnormality on P waves, so we might see on abnormal P waves, so we call that a P mitral. So when you say P mitral is a consequence of like left atrial uh, enlargement, especially for the rheumatic arthritis with severe MS. So they'll, they'll have a lagging of depolarization on the left side. So you might see like M shape. So M-shaped P waves. So that's a P mitral. That's in that, so indirect sign of for uh, mitra, the like mitral stenosis. So the others P pulmonary, which means so it's, it's all about the right atrial enlargement. So it's, it shows like whether it's pulmonary hypertension or not. So if there is a right atrial enlargement, so that we call that a P pulmonary. The P wave will be peaked. So it will be above 2.5 millimeters. So this is the right atrial enlargement will be peak. So you can see here on the ECG. So it seems like almost five small, like five small box or one large box. So P pulmonary or P wave is picked. So that's the patient has like, he might have right atrial enlargement, secondary it will be pulmonary hypertension and so on. So the others left atrial enlargement, you see M shaped. Here, M shaped. You can see here. So, M-shaped biphasic types of P-wave, 
with specified Q values. So that's the three metric. So the others, the next wave is the Q waves. So a ne the negative deflection that just prior to the R wave is the Q waves. So the normal is small in most leads. So are load in leads three and AVRs, usually not seen on V1 and V3. So if you if you get any Q, wave, Q waves and V1 to V3, you have to consider as abnormal or pathology. So when you say pathology Q wave, other than like having Q wave on V1 to V3, so we need to consider the depths of the Q waves, the depths and the width, the widths. So if it's the width is more than two millimeters or more than 40 millisecond, that's considered as a pathologic. And the depth is if it's more than 25% of the Q waves or more than four millimeters, we'll consider as a pathology. So we can see here on this study, so, so this is a negative deflection prior to R wave. So this is deep R wave, deep Q wave. So we'll consider as a pathology. So the next waves are waves. So the dominant R wave in V1 means something. So usually the R wave progression from V1 to V5 to V6, so it's an increasing. So if it's predominant on V1, so you have to interpret there is something which, which is pathology. So we need to consider the differentials. So we can see here, so on V1s, so almost it's compared to R3, when you compare to S wave, it's almost greater than to S wave, or it's, it might be equal to S wave. So always R to S ratio should be less than one. If the R to S ratio is more than one, you have to consider it's a pathology. So when, when you get a big R wave on V1s, so you have to consider dif different differential diagnosis. So patient they can have right wing hypertrophy, pulmonary embolus, like causing the other uh, right wing branch blocks, posterior MI, and so on. So sometimes in infant, in children, so the axis shifted to the right. So right wing, so the right chamber is greater than the left side of the chamber. So it might be normal in children and young adults. So the next one is T waves. So it's represents ventricular polarizations. So usually it's inverted on the AVRs and upright on lead one, lead three, on and on the V3 to V6. And it might it might have variables and other. So if if on the AVRs, Q waves upright, so we have to consider its pathology. So the other you have to consider the height of uh, a T wave as well. So whether T waves peaked or not. So if a P wave ticked, P peaked, which means if it's more than like five small blocks on limb leads or 15 millimeter on pericordial leads, that's will consider as thick T waves. So the others we can consider the T wave changes. So when you get so large T waves, so we have to consider this patient has hyperkalemia, hyperacute T waves considered by MI. So we have to see the morphology. So for hyperkalemia, so usually it's pointing, pointing with short base and usually it's symmetric. So for MI, so the TV visual is broad based here on the right side of the PowerPoint, you can see here. So broad based, broad based, and it's not pointing, it's blended and asymmetry. So you'll consider as usually it's caused by MI. So usually you consider as transmural ischemia. So the others you might get like biphasic. So if you get biphasic or diphasic one, so your interpretation will be on the like the distal one. So let's say the first one, so there is upright, so next one is down. So we'll consider the second one, we'll not interpret the first one. So this is a negative. So the other you can consider here, there's also T waves a type of biphasic. So we'll consider as positive because the distal one is positive. So when you, when you have biphasic, so your interpretation will be on the distal one. So the other is negative. So is it symmetric? So I have to see is it deep, symmetric, and so on. So to consider like is this caused by ischemia or other cause. So usually if it's post ischemia, so usually it's T wave is symmetric. So usually T waves are symmetric with variable depths and range from flat to waves to very deep to wave inversions. So inverted T waves do not uh, like equate acute or acute ischemia, but rather acute after episode of ischemia. So usually post ischemia. So always any ECG is you have to check for serial. So is it dynamic or static is the most important one. So the others is to be caused by like cerebral accident, hypertrophy, and so on. Or the others might be caused by myocarditis. So in, when, it's, when you get inverted T waves, so it might be normal for V1 to V3, 
ካልፓሲስንቱ አዳልትት ያንግ አዳልት ቢ ኖርማል ቫሪያንትስ ባት ዩዙዋሊ ወዘተ ኢት ዳይናሚክ ኦር ስቴብ ሶ ኢፍ ኢትስ ዳይናሚክ ሶ ኢኒሻል ኢት ማይት ቢ ጀስት ፍላትኒንግ ሰብስፌት ኢትስ ኢት ኩድ ቢ ላይክ ኢንቨርትድ ኢን ሶ ዳት ዊል ኢፍ ኢትስ ዳይናሚክ ዊል ኮንሲደር አስ ኢስኪሚያ ኦር ኢንፍራክሽን ኢፍ ኢትስ ስቴብል ኢት ማይት ቢ ላይክ ኦልድ ኢንፍራክሽን ሶ ዊ ኒድ ቱ ሃቭ ኤ ሲሪያል ኢሲጅ ሶ ዳ አዘርስ ሶ ዩዙዋሊ ስሌዛን 3 ስሞል ቦክስ ኦር ኢትስ ሌዛን 0.12 ሰከንድ ኦር ሌዛን 120 ሚሊ ሰከንድ so if you get wide qrs which means it's more than three small box so you have to ask yourself whether it's fast or slow so if wide qrs with stochasticity always you have to consider ventricular tachycardia with a lateral always you have to consider that so if you get a slow one so you'll we'll consider as is it electrolyte hypermobility like hyperkalemia and so on or is it block so if it's like wide qrs slow always you'll we'll consider as bradycardia or electrolyte like block or electrolyte abnormality but if it's fast fast wide so always you have to consider ventricular tachycardia so one of why do you have to qualify like ventricular bundle branch block so a criteria for to have lbb one of the criteria is more than qr is widening which means more than three small box and you will have a dominant s wave in v1 or so we we'll call that a w a w sign and broad broad monophasic r wave in lateral leads lead one avl b5 b6 or m wave m wave shaped on the lateral or w pattern on the v1 or you might have absence q wave in lateral leads and if it's prolonged r wave peak time more than 60 millisecond in v5 to v6 which means monophasic r wave significant predominant more than, like 60 millisecond will consider as lb so you can see here on v1 w pattern or like wide slurped s wave and lateral is v5 v6 you might see so slurped r wave or notched notched r wave or we call that m wave so the others might have like left ventricular hypertrophy sometimes might be confusing whether whether a patient has uh, like lbb or not so on lbb so you know that's a voltage criteria you have a voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy so so we'll add s waves on v1 v2 with largest r wave with v5 v6 will consider as if it's above 35 mm or more than 7 big so we'll consider as uh, elevated but if patient has qr race is narrow like which means less than three small box so we'll consider as elevated rather than elevated but sometimes he can have lvh and lv so to consider that so we'll add so similar to the first line so we'll add we'll add s wave and v1 or v2 and r wave on v5 v5 and v6 and if it's above 45 we'll consider the patient has lvh with lv so the others we can consider like on lateral avl if it's more than 11 so we'll consider r wave predominant of v6 and above 25 we might consider as left ventricular hypertrophy So you can see here on the ECG. So on AVL, you can see here like five, ten, fifteen, almost fifteen. If it's like above eleven, so one of the voltage criteria if AVL is above eleven, so we we'll consider as LVH. Or the others, so we can see S wave on V1 plus R wave on either V5 or V6. We can add up, and if it's above thirty-five, we can consider uh, LVH. But the QR is here; it's now. It's not wide so if it's narrow narrow qrs and narrow qrs and above 35 so that's elevate so if it's wide qrs which means more than three small box so the initial consideration is lbb so we'll see as well on the lateral lead is it monophasic or not is it notched or not so subsequently whether the patient has both lbh or not so we'll add up if it's more than 45 we'll consider lbh with lbb So that is so for right axis deviation. So right ventricular hypertrophy. So if a dominant R wave in V1. So as you remember, on one of the differential diagnosis on right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy. So on V1, if like if R to S ratio more than one, we consider as so right ventricular hypertrophy. But you have to consider always prior to whether the patient has a leakage or R leakage. You have to see the QR race. So if the QR race is narrow, like less than 120 milliseconds, usually consider as right ventricular hypertrophy not usually is caused by right ventricular branch block unless it's 
the incomplete one. So the other uh, segments, so we, we see the P wave, the Q wave, the Q wave, Q wave, S wave, and the T waves. Now we see the segment, which is the ST segment. So this is also one of the most important in the emergency uh, cares. So, so when you see the character, so characteristics of a segment elevation is, is important, whether it's caused by ischemia or MI, or is it called, is it caused by other things? So usually for a segment elevations for ischemia, usually the shape is convex upward. So usually it's convex or straight up sloping or straight horizontal. So usually straight downward is not common. So if you get concave upward, or convex upward, downward, or convex upward. So that's usually is not caused by MI. So it's not caused by ischemia. So the ischemia characteristics is usually convex upward or straight up sloping or horizontal. So if it's convex, you have to consider not caused by MI. So we have to look other cause for a segment elevations. So we have, so this one's the published on New England Journal of Medicine for the cause of a segment elevation, we have a numerous type of a segment elevation as a cause. So it might be normal, like uh, especially a concave upward, it might be normal. And so especially in like 90% of heads, young men, therefore normal elevation might be one to three minutes you might expect on young men. And the others are little polarizations, also a little polarization, a segment elevations, uh, left vein for hypertrophy, LBB, acute pericarditis, electrolyte like hyperkalemia, like Brugada, P. And there are a lot of so cause a segment elevation. So we have to consider whether how many leads are involved on the segment elevations. Is it a contagious leads or not? So that is a shape. Is it concave upward or concave downward? And so, so looking, it's not just consider a segment elevation, not consider as MI. So we have to interpret like, is there any as for change or not for MI interpretation, as it's contagious or you have to look at the shape as well. So when you consider a segment elevation for MI, so, so when you say significant segment elevation or to consider a segment elevation MI, so one thing it should be at least two contagious leads. This is our call to two contagious leads. And the segment elevation should be so for any leads except V2 and V3, if it's greater than or equal to one millimeter, so we'll consider as significant segment elevation. If it's for V2 and V3, so we'll consider age dependent. So which means if the age is above 40, age above 40 and male, so we'll consider if it's greater than or equal to two. It's below 40, so we'll consider if it is above 2.5. For female, it's not age dependent. So for females, Except V2 and V3, if it's above or if it's greater than or equal to one millimeter, it's considered as a significant a segment elevation. For the others, we consider as 1.5 millimeters. So we have to look. So we have to so prior to interpretation, we have to measure is this significant or not? Is this contagious or not? So the others, so prior to when you say contagious, so as they are they on the same territory? So when you say safety, for example, so when you say we are considering septal, so when you say contagious, so it should be V1 and V2. So if you have just V1 a segment elevation, like V3 a segment elevation, or V4 a segment elevation, if it's not too contagious, it will not consider as a segment elevation. It might be caused by other cause, so it might be artifact and so. So to say inferior, L2, V3 is the inferior part of the head. Lateral, usually V5, V6, AVL, and lead one is considered as lateral. So the anterior one is V3, V4, the posterior one is V8 and V9. So V1, V2 is septal, V3, V4 is the anterior. So V5, V6, lead one and AVL is the lateral one. Lead two, lead three, AVL is the inferior. And sometimes the reverse V4. So as I showed earlier on the uh, PowerPoint, so you can have the reverse V4, so it consider as right ventricle. So you have to look for historical change. So once we get, so, MI, a segment elevation caused by MI. So once it is too contagious, lead, is this significant? So the other ones we expect, post, like we expect historical change on uh, a segment elevation MI. So which means we have the acronyms like PACE. So if you have a posterior segment elevation, we expect anterior historical change. 
So if you get inferior one, so we expect on a lateral. So on this acronym, the exception one is lateral. So if you get lateral, which means B1, AV, V5, V6, so you so your reciprocal change will be shifted this to the inferior one. So this rule might not work for the lateral, but it's worked for the others. So we have to check always so the reciprocal change or not. So to say so we can see here on this ECG. So we can look at whether it's segment elevation or not. So we can see here like V4, V5, V6. So this is so before and V5 is like before is the anterior one, but at least two contiguous, meaning V5 and V6 are contiguous one. So this is, so we have two contiguous leads. And is this significant or not? So you can see here. So so you can see this is so you can see here. So it's almost five small. So this is a significant segment elevations. So we can count a J point from a J point. So our J point is here from here. So so almost five small. So this is a significant segment elevation to continuously. And so we have to consider that is polycal change or not. So from a polycal change, if you get a lateral one, so we expect a segment change or spherical change on the inferior one, which means lead to lead three or AVF. So spherical change means, so we might get like T wave flattening here. You can see here, T wave flattening or a segment depression. Now we have just a, like T wave inversion. So T wave inversion also that is spherical change. So the others, so the most important thing, so if we get a segment elevations on lead two, lead three, and ABF, which means on the inferior one, always you have to consider so a patient that, that has right ventricular infarction or posterior MI. Always, so we need to uh, ask ourselves so is it required to have on the right side, uh, on the right side ECG, or can I make it on the posterior or not? So our crew will be on the V1 and V2. So always, so if so we have to see a J point on the J point. So here, a lead, the amount of a segment elevation on lead two or lead three. So if the lead three segment elevation is greater than lead two, and if there is V1, so if there is a segment elevation on V1, so we'll consider this patient, right, patient has right ventricular infarction. So always you have to do on right side limb, on the right side ECG. So the others, similarly, lead two, lead three, a wave involvement of a segment elevation. And if you get, a segment depression on V1 and V2. And if V2 is greater than V1, that's specific for a posterior M1. So we need to do a posterior one, a posterior ECG, like 50 lead ECGs. So, so one, one paper published like uh, on the recognition and management of posterior M1. So also it was a court study. So on conclusion that, so using door to balloon, especially door to balloon time was lagged on patient with posterior MI. So posterior MI, MI is usually neglected. So if you get always lead to lead say ABF, inferior MI, always you have to con you have to consider or you have to rule out right wing crown infraction and posterior MI. So the signs for posterior infractions. So you might get like a segment depressions on view. So always you have to look beyond to V3. On V1 to V3, if there is a segment depressions or like tall broad R wave more than like 30 millisecond upright T wave or dominant R wave in V2 or the R2 S ratio is more than one, so we'll consider a posterior or MI. But if there is a segment elevations on V1 and, and the segment elevation in V1 is greater than V2, that's specific for right ventricular infraction. So just to make it easy. So if you are inferior or MI, and if there is a segment elevation in V1, so we have to consider right ventricular infraction, and you have to do on the right side ECG. So if there is a straight V1, V2, a segment depression, you have to do so 50 lead ECGs. So we have to consider posterior MI. So here, so, so here, as you can see here, so there is like a segment elevation, lead to, lead to, and there is not significant on lead three, so there is a segment elevation on the AVF. 
and V1, V2 is segment depression. So posterior like 50 lead ECG was done. So on that, so there was an A segment significant A segment elevation on V7, V8, and V9. So when you put V7 and V8 and V9, so we took V4, V5, and V6. So you will put V4, so up at posterior axillary line before V5 you will put, that means V8. So you will put at the tip of a scapula and the V9, which means the V6, you will put V6 at the paraspinal, on the right side of paraspinal. So this one is the reverse one, like, so always you have to document as, like whether it's reversed or not. So always you have to write once reversed on the right side. So you have to document uh, like on the paper whether it's reversed, ECG was done or not. So the other is a segment depression. So it's all about ischemia. So if you get a segment depression, so the first one is patient that has cardiac ischemia or not. And the shape is also important for considering MI. So usually a segment, so it's a concave or usually, so the horizontal is most common, but if it's convex, convex, uh, a segment depression is not common for ischemia. So here, so we see a segment depression. So similarly, usually, so still, if you consider MI, so we need to have at least two contiguous leads. So, so two contiguous leads, and it should be more than 0 0.5 millimeters, or if it's 0 0.5 millimeters. If it's more than one millimeter, so usually it, it will tell us the prognosis of a patient. So the other interval is the QT. So QT usually, so the QT interval is important, especially for electrolyte anomaly, like this patient has hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and so on. Usually for hypo, the QTC will be prolonged, which means the normal is usually from 0 0.35 to 2. 0.45. So if it's above 0 0.45 and QTC prolongation, you have, you have to consider for the hypo or low electrolyte abnormality. And if the QTC is shortened, usually if it is like the less than 0 0.35 in general, so we can take like for me 0 0.33 or for female 0 0.34. So we have to consider for hyper, like hyperkalemia, like hyper like hypercalcemia or so. So we need to consider that one. So it's important QTC is QT is interval. QT interval is important for electrolyte special. So when you say QT, so it depends on the rate of a patient. So we need to correct, uh, like uh, so when you say QTC is a corrected QT interval. So it's the QT interval is depend on the heart rate. So that uh, depends on the heart rate. So normally it's the QTC is uh, calculated on the ACG. So we can see the, the QTC corrected one. So the interpretation is not for the QT, but for the QTC. So if not, you can calculate the number of QT over under radical square of R to R interval in seconds. So we can calculate it or you can take from the ECG papers. So the other is that has low voltage or not. So a limb leads. So when you say uh, like low voltage, it might be caused by like obesity, pericardial effusion, myxedema, COPD, and so on. So when you say low voltage, so you can take either a limb leads or a p or PR leads. So on limb leads, the entire QR is complex. We might add like uh, R, R plus S. If it's less than five millimeter, you consider as low voltage. And if it is on pre cordial leads, if it's less than 10 millimeters, consider as low voltage. For the pre cordial 10 millimeter, and for the limb is less than five millimeters, consider as low voltage. So in general, in summary, so, so always you need to consider and what's the normal ECG. So we have to see the normal ECG. Always you have to read with like with step with step by step reading. So we don't have to consider. So we have to we don't we don't have to be like distracted with the pathology one. And so always the ECG should be a dynamic, especially if you consider ischemia infraction. So we have to have a serial ECGs. So this is my ECG resources. So you can access with like special life in the fast lanes and the ECG made simple.com or so there is also a famous book you can see with Amal like with the professor Amal Matus textbook like ECG for emergency physicians. So thank you for thank you for your listening. So I look at whether you have a question or not. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Malaku, for this interesting presentation.
so since we, we only have a few minutes, uh, let's just dive into the Q&A section. And uh, we are only gonna take two questions. So the questions in the Q&A section, I can read it to you and you can give a short explanation. So it is from uh, Brooks Farrow. It says, what are the factors affecting ECG reading? So sorry, I think I think I, I took a lot of time. So so coming to for the first question, as you said, like a factor affecting for ECG reading. So we have like different factors. Like so, start from the machines, whether it's a machines correct or not. The first one on the machines, a number of speeds. Like I've already mentioned that the number of like is it twenty five millimeters per second normally for the speed. So we can set up by any. Uh, like attendance, you can see that like 25 millimeters per second or 50 millimeters per second. So you have to check that one. With others, even the patient one. So, uh, so patient like if patient has trimmering and so on. If patient has hair and so on, so might consider like artifact. So patient and the machine, uh, the machine itself could be the factor affecting for ECG reading. The others a competency level as well. So how 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 we are competent in a so that's a competence. So three of them is, will be the factor affecting for ECG readings. Okay, great. Uh, then one last question. Uh, let's take Dawit Sagai's questions. Uh, if you open, uh, doctor, if you open the Q&A section, uh, he, have, uh, he wrote three questions. So please give a, show, a really brief uh, explanation and we'll end uh, the Q&A session. Okay. So I'll pass on the third brand. So, so on third brand, so what are the main gender based? So just to sum up on that, so I tried to mention to which one is like gender based and age dependent, especially on age dependence. So I have tried to see like especially on the like on the right side chambers dilatation is in there, the right chamber uh, predominance in pediatric. So our uh, so our interpretation also different from the right side and the left side. And the others, how to get isoelectric line? Okay. Ventricular type cardiac polymorphic, okay. So how to get isoelectric line in ventricular polymorphic VTAC? So as to say a segment elevations, so it's hard to differentiate isoelectric line as a bit for a segment elevation or not. So this one is, so if you get polymorphic, uh, VTAC or like torsadis and so on. So a segment elevation, so it's difficult to find because you don't have to say a segment elevation or not. So one thing you need to have keyword is complex and you will measure from a TP. Now we don't have that one. So if if you have VTAC, so the first one that the patient has a LBB or not. So if you have a LBB associated with a LBB, you might consider like is it new or not. So new, you might consider as MI, you might treat that one. If not, so you might use like you know, the modified sagarosa and so on. So the other important thing is, so you have to correlate with the patient, like you might have a troponin, a clinical presentation of the patient is important. So ECG by itself is not uh, diagnosed, so we have to correlate a patient condition, like clinical condition, uh, like the, bio the, the our laboratory, and last, the imaging one. Okay, uh, I think uh, that's it. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Malaku, for presenting us uh, this presentation in, in such an interesting manner. I, we all know uh, a pro, uh, ECG is a vast topic, and thank you for presenting, for presenting it in this way. And uh, we hope to see you in our future uh, webinars to present a little more about these topics. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Malaku. Okay, thank you. Oh, 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 oh,